There we go. Okay. We're live. Um, it took me a second to get that organized. Okay. Um, as always, I'm going to wait for my gorgeous Shay to join me today. gosh this update has been like totally messing with me i'm like it wasn't working for a second i was stressed oh my um but here we are i know it my phone is being so weird but we know, it looks different like <laughs> hi everyone <laughs> this i'm so excited for this episode me too me too we've been like seriously talking about this for so long it's like so nice that we're finally going to talk about it I know um I guess we probably could just start just jump right into it why not okay well um welcome everyone uh this is jawbreaker season two episode two money plus fame equals good art Question mark. Um, uh, do you make better art when you're rich and famous? Um, we're gonna. So um, Shay and I were. Oh, you're. Oh my god, connection oh, is not. You're just lagging. I know. So are you. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, carry on. Oh my god, no, you go. Um, well, no, you were doing the intro. You carry on. Okay. Um, so Shay and I have been wondering uh, for quite some time um, how artists become celebrities and how they become famous. Um, so we've been thinking about this for quite some time now. When I, um, like back when I was in school, I did this project um, and it was like a CV dissection. So we looked at, um, like everyone got to choose an artist who was successful and then go back through their CV and find out like how they like garnered that success um so we were supposed to look at like what was their first um gallery show who was there what curators were there like um how did that jump to the next show and like really find out like um like the steps as to how they became who they were then um and so uh, I chose Matthew Barney, and we're not going to go into his um, career, but uh, just to give you an idea of like what a CV dissection might look like and a bit of background into his career, we've put that with our resources on our website, um, jigglingjuicecollective.com. Um, so you could have a look through that if you wanted to um, see how a CV, CV dissection is, is, uh, is done and how he launched his career. Um, and there's also, of course, our regular resources that we'll be referring to in this episode. Yeah. Um, so essentially, there's a lot. There's a lot to unpack in this episode. So we're gonna we're gonna try to keep it um, concise. Um, we've done a lot of research for this one, so um, hopefully we can deliver the research. Um, effectively but like there's a bunch of things that kind of in terms of our conversations like personally that we've like set out to like look at and, and explore um so we're really curious to see whether like art is good just because people love them so like if you are like really 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 passionate about an artist and they release something that like is a little bit out of the box like are you automatically conditioned to be like, this is good art because it's by this person? Like, um, yeah, it's just it's just like, that's one of the really interesting like questions that we kind of set out to, to ask. And also the whole kind of dynamic between like good and bad art and also love versus hate in terms of like artist figures, um, Damien Hurst and Jeff Koons, but we're not gonna talk about that. Um, today we might do another episode about um, those two, but we're just not going to talk about them because 
frankly they do not deserve it um a couple of like the factors that we're going to talk about um are and um, do you make better art when you're born into privilege um like your family and how like how does that um impact your career also do you get a free pass automatically when you're famous and um, to just make bad art or make whatever art you want um, and then also how much of an impact your um, education plays um, in your success so whether it's like a really prestigious art school that you went to or if you went to like a really expensive art school like how much does that actually um, give you in terms of like whether you're going to be successful or not um so we're obviously going to be referring to notes here but i just to like start off i want to talk i want to like read a little statement out that um we found that was like really like just interesting do you know who it doesn't say on here who is it by do you remember because I, I feel like it was you that found this one it was it was from an article from the huff post okay um it was from an article called when fame replaces art Okay, well, we can link it, but I'm just going to read it out quickly just as a little, like, starting point. Um, so it says, Once my students begin to pay attention, they realise that many of the artists at the top of the economic heap in today's art world aren't necessarily those who have made substantial aesthetic contributions. The artists they come across in the media are often those who have rigged the system by mastering the art of getting the public's attention and then holding on to it. They are artists slash celebrities, and fame is a crucial prop in the pricing structure. Fame is also a shield that deflects and distorts tough critical questions and obscures whatever art may or not be present. So I think that's just like a really good, like we were thinking about ways that we could just say it without like not saying the quote, but I just feel like it just encapsulates the whole vibe of like, the whole thing of like capturing the public's attention by like one thing and then just like their career is based off of that one thing. Um, so it's just really interesting. Yeah. Um, and just the part about how fame acts as a shield and deflects and restore distorts tough critical questions and so i feel like this is where we get into these like muddy waters of is something good or bad is it because people love it or hate it like what makes something good and um i feel like that could be that's a whole other discussion i feel like that's basically like what all of art criticism is is seeking out is something good or is it bad or is it just subjective? Like... Yeah, totally. Um, so the the episode today is going to be um, split into two parts. So the first part is basically us delivering the research that we found. Um, and then the second part, we're going to do a case study, um, basically another kind of CV dissection sort of thing to kind of put the research into practice and, and how we sort of like... Um, how we sort of put it yeah into practice I just repeated myself for no reason um so <laughs> with that we can just get started yeah okay so part one the research um so the art world really plays by its own economic rules like the if there's like a, an economy crash like the art the art market really is just an enigma it's like really on its own playing field and like the reason why some artists work sell sell for like millions and millions of dollars um, is there's just a consensus in the art world that those works are worth that much money and should sell for that much money like you see these artists selling their works like what, what was it Jeff Kuhn sold um, a sculpture for like 61 million dollars like astronomical um like these prices are so ridiculous because people who are in a financial position to go and buy this art um are just buying it from a small portion of artists um that are represented by a small portion of galleries like it's just such a small uh little pool of money that just gets circulated around and the demand is obviously not evenly distributed across all living and working artists as we know um and like we came across this term called a brand name artist and I like I think this is so perfect because like you think of like Andy Warhol is like such a brand name artist or yeah like Jeff Koons I hate to keep bringing him up but like <laughs> um so like buying an artwork by a brand name artist um is like for lack of a better term a dick measuring contest for the uber wealthy it like what was that thing you were telling me with Kris Jenner 
Oh my god! Yeah, I think I feel like there was a. I don't watch the Kardashians, but like I think there was a clip that I saw on my Explore page, and like so, Chris Jenner is like holding this like mini Jeff Koons balloon dog, and like Chloe comes in and is like, "What is that?" And then Chris is like, "Art." <laughs> and then Chloe's like, "But like what though?" And then she's like, "I don't know. It's a famous guy. It was like a lot of money, and it's like so. It's a it's a good piece of work." And like for like. I, like, as like an artist to hear that conversation it just like basically sums up how the dynamic between like the like ultra famous like celebrities and like celebrity artists who are basically endorsed by these people who are like oh so this is expensive so it's good and I must own one and I like I don't know how much that would have cost Kris Jenner to buy but like probably a lot of money to me and not very much money to her but so it's this is just why it's like the playing field is like not level you know yeah 100 percent. i know it's like it was like buying like a louis vuitton bag it's just like a marker of of wealth even if you don't care about fashion or art like anyways so back to the research um so like um our first question was does having rich parents help propel your career. Um, so we have two studies that we're drawing from here. The first one is called The Origins of Creativity, The Case of the Arts in the U.S. Since 1850 by Carol Jan Bor Borowski, um, a professor of economics. Um, so <laughs> uh, this one uh, compares the socioeconomic backgrounds and geographic locations of participants that would class themselves as artists or creative professionals. And according to this study, for every ten thousand dollars in addition additional family income, a person is around two percent more likely to go into a creative occupation. Um, and the reason for this is, if you can rely on family support, it makes it easier to enter a less financially lucrative field. So essentially, like if you are lined up with people and you can be like, okay, so I make. 100k and then someone else is like okay well I make um what, what am I trying to, I, so if someone ha if someone let's do an easier example for me not being able to do maths this is <laughs> um so if someone makes 60k and someone else is like okay well I make 70k and then it kind of goes up like that in this like metaphorical line of people each person it goes up in increments of two percent based on the money and increments of 2% in terms of your inevitable success in the art world. And like, this is a study, this has literally been proven. How, like that just makes, it's just so depressing. <laughs> like, the, the, it, like the foundations of the art world are like based on figures like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and like off of that, the, there was a New York Times report in 2017 uh, that showed that 22, 23 and 24 year olds aspiring uh, to work in art and design are the most likely to receive financial assistance from their parents um, with 53% reporting help. And they also receive the most money, uh, an average of $3,600 to a year compared to the average $2,000 for their peers in other fields. Um, so this highlights the invisible role of class in the art world, and it points to some of the challenges in bringing economic diversity to an industry that values humanism and resourcefulness, but simultaneously relies on the ability to engage and feel comfortable with deep pocketed collectors. So I can't remember where I heard this from because I would love, I like, I would love to know where it, like, some, so who told me this, but, um, largely the, um, artists are definitely more like left-leaning um like in a political ide ideological sense um and um the people who are in the uber wealthy um they are um they're more like right-wing like usually like where all of this money is coming from is like from industries like oil and gas or um like old trust money that was like back in the you know colonizer days that's been like funneled down through these families and so there's this like great divide of like like 
the artists trying to like make the work that's valuable to them, but then also kind of cater to these more like right wing deep pocket collectors. So I think that's like an interesting divide as well. Um, so like ways to com combat this uh, inequality is um, obviously paid internships, affordable housing, um, funding and grants uh, to help with your fees. And I just want to add in a little bit more radically that school should just be free. I think post-secondary should just be free for all people, no student debt. Um, but I don't think we're ready for that conversation yet. I mean, a girl, a girl can dream. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then uh, just to finish that one off, the tw there was a 2014 study um, done by the Census Bureau data from the Hamilton Project that found that fine arts majors are among the lowest earning graduates but their earning trajectory is among the steepest. And so their initial earnings barely surpass $15,000, but can more than double within the first five years of their career, um, which highlights how critical that financial support um, during those 20 something years are. And so if you're not getting that additional support from your parents or your family, like you're not gonna be able to survive on like what small income you're making, which usually results in artists kind of giving up their dreams to become an artist and choose something that's like more practical um to earn the money whereas like people who do have that financial support can push through those lower earning years to become more successful more rich and famous like but i feel like with that the whole the what really kind of like is just so interesting about the trajectory like for any kind of like n normal job like if you work in stem for example like your earnings will um increase through things like promotions and like you know working your way up like gradually and then but so it is just like kind of that's just the, the way that it works but with, with artists and like the art world you could literally go from like making no money then you have like a breakthrough show and then everyone like wants you in their gallery and then your like earnings could just like fucking skyrocket and this is just like so daunting and like s that's why it makes it so difficult to navigate because it's not like you can be like ah I'll follow this you know lovely little path and I'll work really hard because I know it'll pay off in the end like mm -hmm. there's no that and there's no right way to do it um which is just like bad <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um so like so yeah that was that was do rich parents help yes what about your social circle though um so from this study um uh called fame as an fame as an illusion of creativity evidence from the pioneers of abstract art and uh, this article is by paul ingram um, so this one just researched the social ties and the level of fame achieved by 90 pioneering abstract artists. And it found that there was no statistical support for the relationship between the artist's creativity and the fame they ultimately achieved. No statistical support between creativity and fame. <laughs> um, <laughs> he found that the artists who had a diverse set of friends um, and professional contacts from different industries were statistically better to become famous. Great. <laughs> so, so basically, like, you got to have, like, a good circle of mates and, um, like, know the right people from art school and, like, have, you know, influential families in order to actually make it, according to this study. And yeah. the study on 90 artists. Like, and I feel like, and there was a demographic that I saw in this article that, and it was all, it wasn't like in America. I think it was all around the world. So it's not just like something in the States. This is genuinely like the state of the art world, like everywhere. Yeah. Wild. Yeah. Um, so if creativity has like no, there's no statistical data to link it to becoming famous, this leads us to how does bad art become so famous. Um, so we found this, uh, this study that um, was done, this experiment that was done that we found like so fascinating. So it was conducted by Matthew Salganik, uh, professor of sociology at Princeton University. 
Um, and he started thinking about how success and specifically how much success should be attributed to the inherent qualities of the successful thing itself and how much is just chance. Um, and so <laughs> his hypothesis says that for some essentially random reason, a group of people decided that the thing in question was really good and their attention attracted more attention until there was a herd of people who believed that it was um, special, mostly because all the other po people believed it was, but the successful thing wasn't in fact very special. Um, so he wanted to test how much success should be attributed to chance versus quality. Um, so how he did this was he um, uh, created a website that funneled uh, 30,000 teenagers that he had recruited into um, on, to an online um, ident or sorry, um, <laughs> he recruited to online. In oh my gosh, this sentence is not working out for me. <laughs> um, there was nine identical worlds on an online platform. The students were funneled into each one. Um, and so in each one of these worlds, uh, they exposed the teens to 48 songs by emerging artists, uh, bands that hadn't yet been signed and so they were completely unknown. Um, so after listening to the songs, the teens could download the songs that they liked the best for free. Um, so in the control world, um, the teenagers couldn't see what their friends were downloading or what other people were downloading. Um, and so they just purely uh, downloaded the ones that they liked. Whereas in eight other worlds, you could see who is downloading things more frequently than, uh, than others. Um, and so this like drastically changed the results. So in one world, um, they had this song called Lockdown by the band 52 Metro. And Selgenik says that in this world, like, this song came first, ranked first out of all of them. And then in another world, it came 40th out of 48. And it was exactly the same song, just in different worlds. Um, it it, it um, succeeded differently. Um, and so the, the conclusion that he came to is that it's very hard for um, like a poor quality thing to succeed. But if you meet a basic standard of quality, then what becomes a huge hit and what doesn't is essentially just a matter of chance. Which is like, I'm sorry, that's just mental. Like, <laughs> makes so much sense because music and art and all that it is subjective. But, <clears throat> but for it to be proven that like something is more successful, because other people think it is like, that's essentially the whole vibe of this study. Like, and that's what he actually ended up, like he went, he sought out, he set out to prove that. And mm -hmm. that is what he did prove. So like, obviously everyone has their own sort of like opinions and, and like preferences. But then the fact that without even knowing it, it uh, social influence can play such a massive part in like things you decide and mm -hmm. think and decide what you deem as good is like, crazy like that's just mad and the whole this whole thing can be applied directly to the art world as well um which is just again like just yeah crazy crazy um so i'm going to talk a little bit about um our case studies so this is the second part of the episode um and so yeah you can download the um cv dissection that we did well I say we, it was you, that Georgia did um, of Matthew Barney, that's available on our um, website. If you want to see it kind of like written, it might be a little bit more like, uh, like easier to follow. I'm going to try and make it like as easy to follow as possible because there is like a lot. Um, but uh, so we're, we've chosen to look at um, Chloe Wise, who is one of our favorite artists. <laughs> But the catch is, we fucking hate her. <laughs> we love her and hate her. We love to hate her. We hate to love her. It's a complicated, a messy relationship. <laughs> Honestly, yes. So first, before I like go into all of this, I just want to say like, this is uh, um, what Jodie said, just popping on to say hello and fuck Jeff Coon slash Damien Hurst. Yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, so back to my disclaimer. 
um we really aren't like setting out to like bash her um or hate on her at all like we love her work and we are like just jealous essentially like you know <laughs> I, have, I don't have any problem like admitting that um but we just wanted to use her as an example for this because she has a ridiculously impressive career cv she's only young um and uh yeah we just wanted to like find out what the pinnacle moment of like her career breakthrough was and um, because obviously it's easier to kind of find this kind of information on people who are like dead kind of morbid but like this kind of information doesn't usually like kind of present itself like here you go until like you know after their career is over essentially so we just kind of wanted to do the research for ourselves and find out ourselves like how Chloe Wise became Chloe Wise. Um, so if you're not familiar with her work, she um, is from Montreal, but she's now based in New York and has been for some time. Um, she's known primarily for her paintings and sculptures, um, which explore notions of food, identity, the body, all that lovely stuff. Um, she is no stranger to the lavish, like, Insta like influencer life like she presents that like if you go to her Instagram you'll definitely see it maybe not so much because of lockdown but like prior to lockdown um she like goes to fashion shows she'll be like reclining on like a plush leather couch in her like satin nighty um all of the all of the stuff that just makes me want to like be her and like hate her at the same time um so but what we are interested in, in is how she kind of like established this life for herself um so there's a couple of things that I'm going to talk about first of all the people in her life um that might be of some significance so after some digging um she doesn't speak explicitly about her parents and what they do I found separately like I found separately it was it was kind of like, I feel like I was totally like, this is just like obsessive, the amount of research I did for this. But like in one article, she mentioned that her dad was an accountant. And then in another uh, article, she mentioned like what his actual name is. And I was like, okay, I know enough information now. And I think I found his CV online. This is all sounding so weird. I hate myself, but it's for a good cause. So <laughs> it is the guy that I think it is. Um, he has served on several boards and committees of... Um, professional societies and charitable organizations um, he is like a really professional successful probably very in influential man um, with a lot of power and status in his profession and in his like career and world I guess um, and the second person of to note is um, her husband unsure still unsure of the vibe here but basically um, on her Instagram, she kind of was like talking about how she's married to um, Eric Wareheim, um, who you might know from Master of None. Um, and so he's an actor, comedian, director, like all that. Like he's a famous man. Um, but this is like completely unconfirmed and like probably a joke. Like I'm not really sure if it's just like a rich person joke that I just don't understand. But yeah, apparently she's like married to this guy. Um, but like if she's not married to him they're like very close friends and like they hang out all the time and it just so happens that she has she uses his studio um his office sorry she uses his office as a gallery um so like you know just where all his other like rich friends will be like hanging out and like you know just like walking around in like her art is just there for like all the other like famous actors and directors and shit so that's interesting um and yeah so that's like you know the the core of it the base of it like her the people who she is like surrounded by and like in, influenced by and that she has to support her are clearly very influential people in New York um, and in Canada I guess um so I um put together a timeline I really hope I feel like it's easier to like see so maybe I'll like write I'll kind of like write it out another time because I just I worry that like giving the dates will be kind of confusing but I'll try and make it like swift um so this is basically my research into her like breaking breakthrough point breaking point no she's not got there yet her breakthrough point of like how she became so um famous and everyone was, became obsessed with her so in march 2014 um she had her first ever group exhibition called de inviting don lothario um, which was in montreal it was her grad show i think she maybe got picked up at her at her um grad show and this was like 
following that. So that was March 2014. Um, then in October 2014, so like a couple months later, um, her friend, Bobby Salvor Menuez, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but bear with. You might know her from um, White Girl, that that film. It's really good. It's on Netflix. You should watch it. But anyway, she's, she's in that. Um, so Bobby basically asked to borrow um, one of, Chloe Wise's bagel bag so she does these like sculptural bags and um, that look like food and there was um it was called bagel bag number five which was basically like a parody of Chanel um and Bobby was going to a Chanel event so she was like hey it would be so funny if like um I like wore this at this event and like I wonder the, the press will go mad because it'll look like a like a bagel Chanel bag um and so that happened and the internet did in fact go crazy everyone was like oh my god Chanel have a new line of bags and it was like all like everyone was so excited you can see um on the resources um some of the like headlines from that time when everyone was obsessed over it and it became like a massive story and everyone was just like crying about this bag um and then it came out that obviously no it wasn't a real Chanel bag it was this this artist Chloe Wise and then everyone was like oh my god she's amazing um so that was in October 2014 and then fast forward six months to March or you know roughly six months to March 2015 um when she had her first ever solo show um in Montreal then in May the same show was showcased um in Toronto so there she's already done like three major exhibitions within like a year um and then in June so the year the month after that she had her first solo international show um which was in Switzerland um and I found out as well um on the website for the gallery that she actually undertook a residency in the in the gallery um and made the work that was going to be exhibited like at like in the studio that was the gallery which is like obviously like a really amazing opportunity to have that that time dedicated to making a new body of work and then so that was in the June and then in, in the November she had her first ever solo show in New York um and obviously that like is a massive deal from to go from like in 18 months just to kind of being exhibited where you went to school to being shown like in New York wild um and so basically like after that her career like exploded if you go onto our website you can see like her cv and stuff which is obviously where i got most of this information um so since then since 2015 she's been exhibited in 33 group shows and i counted that from the list of selected exhibitions so it's not even all of them that's like not i don't know any like how she actually has been but there were 33 on her website um, and then eight solo shows in London, New York, Denmark, Paris, LA, Brussels, Greece, Sweden like literally this girl is like everywhere um, over the next like what six years um, and even through the pandemic she was getting shows and like what the fuck man so everyone loves her because you know she her work is amazing but it's just kind of what that kind of timeline shows is that the bag like the bagel bag being shown Bobby wearing that bag at the Chanel show and then the press catching on to it is that was her like moment where she was like I this is me I've like I've done it and like it's, it's genius like it fucking worked and like her career is insane like she's only I actually think she's only 30 like she, or maybe even younger than that and her like her career is like has just skyrocketed because of this one really like perfectly timed moment um another thing that I want to look at is um got her gallery representation like currently I couldn't find a backlog of um who's represented her in the past but currently she's represented by three galleries and like I don't know if I just maybe don't know much about this because I've never been represented by a gallery and like I don't really know much about it anyway just in general um but like I wasn't really sure of like was there benefits to being um represented by more than one like I kind of thought it was just one um and that the other one like other people would not want like would not want to represent you if you already were being represented but no um so she's represented by um a gallery in London 
who um, on their website, it says that they present minimal and conceptual art by emerging mid-career and established artists. So you've got like a whole wide range of people being exhibited by this gallery. Um, and one of them is Jeff Coons. So like, imagine just having like, just casually just having your name like on the same list as, as him. Um, and then another gallery in Canada, um, which basically just kind of like encapsulates all of like um, Canada's um, most important contemporary artists. She's she's represented by them, and then also one in Switzerland, um, which is basically they they work with private collections as well as international institutions. So their their connections are like wild. Like this is a really important gallery to be represented by, and also. Um, the majority of young people and emerging artists who are represented by this gallery have their first um, European solo show through the gallery, which in this case is correct for Chloe Wise. This is who she was exhibited with for her first international show. So like, I think their kind of standpoint is to be like, come to us and like you'll get international recognition, which she did. Um, so I wanted to look at, um, because after like I wasn't really going to mention this but then I, I just kind of found it interesting like um, whether there were benefits of being ex uh, represented by more than one gallery and I found a really great article by Justin Camp um, which basically says yes there are benefits and lots of them um, so I'll just go through them uh, just quickly but um, the main one is the fact that you have an expanded access to collectors like it, obviously it makes sense like the more people that you are represented by the more odd your audience is like oh you have a wider audience is what I'm trying to say um and also as a result of that um you have greater financial capability so um the galleries can work together for like somehow I don't know that's just what this guy says um and then you have like essentially like better resources better exhibitions like a more widespread um like knowledge of like art fairs and collectors and collections and stuff um and then you also have the chance to um build better institutional recognition in different parts of the world which obviously makes sense if you're represented in europe um and also like in like canada like obviously you know you're gonna you're gonna your reach is gonna be wider um and then this one is the one that like i mainly wanted to like highlight because this is just like wild to me so um, there's the ability to increase your pricing if you're if you are represented by more than one gallery so when working with an additional gallery or in her case like three galleries in total the market expands naturally because your audience is bigger because of all the different places you're being shown in um, so your prices automatically can go up and change because of the wide range of audience which is like like that no wonder she wants to be exhibited I wants to be represented by like all of these people at once because your prices go up you make more money you're more successful so wild <laughs> and I feel like something I was thinking about when, when we were talking about gallery representation and her being represented by three galleries is like this is like I don't know I, I feel like this is kind of obvious but it kind of just clicked for me today like fully that I was like she's a full-on professional artist like that's all she does is yeah. she like makes sculptures and paintings all day every day that's how that's how she makes money like she doesn't have to waste her time like working some damn like customer service job to like make ends meet you know like um uh, like she like all her time can go to make making work like that's how she is like has so much work to show and sell is because that's all she's doing so a reminder for everyone who's still working <laughs> and it's okay you don't have like a new painting to post every week <laughs> like we're trying trying to make it work yeah no anyway, things to think about things to keep in no, mind that is honestly like a really good point because I like wish that I had that life that I could just be like hey I fancy making some like really large scale work and like <laughs> can someone <laughs> <laughs> and you, you like literally like spending like like 24 hours writing funding applications anyway <laughs> um, so something um else that's like just really interesting is kind of like her the way that people write about her success and also the way that she writes about her success um 
So there's an article um, from Vice who um, have called her a born networker. Let's take a moment. Like, <laughs> we were shocked I, by this. <laughs> but if somebody was to describe me as that, which it's not true, like, I'm not a sociable person and I don't do very well in social situations. But, like, if somebody was to brand you as, a born networker like that says a lot about you as a as a person like not not gonna throw any shade but like maybe negatively like I don't know if I would want to be like it kind of sounds like a bit like weaselly you know that you're gonna like you know get your fucking foot in the door at every opportunity like I'm not sure like obviously it's a good thing because look it's paid off for her and like I'm just some like you know a 2020 grad just being like I want this girl's life so like <laughs> So, like ultimately it doesn't really matter but um a, a quote like after that said um they said her social fluidity led to the confluence that first placed her faux chanel bag so like basically what they're saying is the fact that she is so like good at networking and it, it like courses through her blood um had like and, and then she kind of had the initiative to do the chanel bag with bobby like it wasn't a mistake that she did that and she knew that, that it would probably like most likely blow her up and it would be like she knew what she was doing which is iconic like can't lie um mm. and like something that you said Georgia that was like when we were talking about this was really interesting like you were like she must have like a motivation for every like event or friendship or person that she knows in her life like her motivation must always be like how can this impact my career like how can this propel my career how can this like to be called a born networker that's what that equates to for me well yeah that's that's how we interpreted it was yeah. having a motivation like looking at her her husband faux husband um eric weimer like the fact that she is exhibiting her work in his office space his gallery space like the the amount of people that that would reach like to become friends with more actors more models more like celebrity personalities influencers like it's just really like expanding your network so it's not just networking with other art people it's like you're like trying to network with some way bigger players in terms of wealth and status yeah and so like the way that she writes about her her success is also really interesting so she in an in an interview she admitted that her social media inherently possesses a volatile disjuncture in that there exists simultaneously a persona and an extreme honesty this persona is almost comically honest to the point that they are inseparable from the performed or exaggerated images of the persona so basically there's no fucking way to tell like what's authentic and what is performed, which obviously is like the beauty of social media. You know, everyone is subject to it. Like it's the same for everyone. This isn't like exclusively her, but the fact she acknowledges that I think is so interesting. Like the fact that she's like, yeah, bitch, I'm playing a game. Obviously I am, everyone is. Um, and I just think that's really interesting. Um, she also says that I understand that as a 25 year old, this is at the time she was younger. Um, I understand that as a 25 year old white cisgendered Jewish girl of privilege, I am perceived in a certain way, whether that is positive or negative, And I'd like to play with my own image and watch the reactions change. So like, she, like she literally is like, I know I am rich and I know that I was always gonna be rich. And it's like, ooh, I don't know. I just find it so odd for like to say, I like, yeah like well done for like acknowledging that you're an issue but like art world uh, the, the art world is flawed like inherently like but I just think it is just so interesting that she's like I like to watch like you know like people be annoyed and people be like jealous and like like I guess like I don't know what that's like <laughs> I know, I feel like I'm just, like, I'm so, like, I just want everyone to like me. Like, I really want everyone to perceive me positively. And then she's like, I don't care how people perceive They're going to perceive me. And that's what's going to, like, you know, bring me more, like, fame and attention. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I can do that. But. No, I, like, yeah. <laughs> um. So, basically, what that kind of suggests to me is that, like, 
networking for her in this case anyway is just like such an important part of your career your career's success um and basically like her like innate ability to network and network just to select the perfect few people um is basically why like she is who she is and she her career looks the way it does and she's got such a an impressive cv and like it is like ultimately down to down to that so i feel like that was a lot and i'm (laughs) um for like holding in there i hope that like it would like the main the main point of this was i feel to (laughs) to reassure myself so hopefully to like reassure like everyone watching that like this kind of success there's a lot of things that um that contribute to it that maybe isn't accessible to you and like i think that just because chloe wise acknowledges the fact that she's from this privileged background it doesn't make her any less part of the problem like i know that she's obviously not like the core of the problem but like i said what i said um so she like i know like she worked super hard to like get to where she's at and like everything that she's achieved is like so incredible and like obviously her skill set as like an artist is ridiculous like she's so unbelievably special and talented like I like that's there I like I'm not denying that but I just think that like if if success isn't measured by like your output so like the art that you create and it's to do with money like and who you know and then also like chance you know like how 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 can I relate to like I can't relate to that because like I can't see those opportunities ever presenting themselves to me in that way um because I like I literally I live in Aberdeen and like you know I don't have any connections with like actors and like New York people and like you know I just think that it's just so like scarily unattainable and I just I wonder like if if Bobby didn't ask Chloe for the bag like imagine if the bag like was in an exhibition and then Chloe was like oh no you can't like it's not available or like imagine if Bobby didn't even like Chloe didn't even think to ask like it was Bobby that was like oh I can I wear that to the event it'll be funny um like imagine if that just didn't happen for whatever reason Mm. like would her career have fast tracked as quickly as it did like where would she be now without that one like moment of chance and yeah it's just interesting to me yeah yeah definitely like I feel like in closing um like for this episode I feel like um there's just like a common misconception that artists become successful and famous because they make good art period um but it's really like as we've said it's like about it's about who you know how good you are at networking being at the right place at the right time and like a big part of it is honestly just like dumb luck. Um, But like my final thoughts on this whole thing is, can you become a famous artist without hobnobbing and schmoozing? Maybe not. (laughs) Can you make good art without coming from privilege and wealth? Absolutely you can. We've seen so many artists come up with such good art that were not from privilege and wealth. Can you become a successful artist without all of the stuff that we talked about in this episode, rich parents, prestigious art degree, networking, all sort of stuff. And I think that just depends on how you define success and what is ultimately important to you. So if just making art is a joy for you and a a tool for you to understand yourself and the world that you live in, and you're doing that and and making work and that's the most important thing like then that's perfect that's success if you want to be rich and famous um i think it's definitely a little bit more of a a challenging road and you have to work a lot harder to get there but um i think ultimately like find out what what success means to you and to uh align that with your values (laughs) Your 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 closing statement was so much more wholesome than mine. I sound like <laughs> well, <a> bit. <laughs> well, had to bring it around. <laughs> um, um, 
Well, we That's went out with the intention of it being 25 minutes long, and here we are 50 minutes later. Um, but thank you so much to everyone who popped in, who joined us, who stuck it out with us this whole time. Um, this will be posted on our um, IGTV and also um, on our website, on our YouTube. Um, so there's many ways you could watch it back if, if you weren't here on a Sunday afternoon evening. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you next month for episode three. And Bye, everyone. For staying that whole time, because there was a lot. It was a lot, yes. <laughs> you. Okay. okay, bye. <laughs>